there, students, and welcome back to Intensive Review. In this segment, we're going to review USHC 7.1 that is dealing with American neutrality immediately preceding World War II and looking at the process by which the United States got involved after avoiding the war to a large extent. Now, in Europe, there were several, and even beyond Europe, you have Japan as well, that you have the rise of military dictatorships. You need to at least know who these people are and where they were, all right? That you've got Stalin in the Soviet Union, Mussolini in Italy, Hitler in Germany, and Tojo in Japan. So all of those could be mentioned on an exam. So make sure you know who each of these people are and where they were. Okay, and good. Some of you aren't, like, struggling to write that stuff down because you know it already. All right, excellent. Should have gotten that out of another class. Now, the Japanese are expanding, and this is what's going on in the 1930s. Germany and Japan are both expanding. They are both aggressing, and this is the type of behavior that the League of Nations was founded to stop. Now, you see Japanese expansion. You see German expansion. And the solution that is thought of by the leaders of Europe is a solution of appeasement. Now, appeasement, I compare that to kind of like a baby or something like that. When a baby's crying, you can appease that baby. You can give the baby a pacifier or something like that. You can hold the baby for a bit or something like that. But it's not going to last. That baby will not stay pacified forever. And this is how you need to think about Hitler, that people think, okay, well, Hitler is going to be pacified. All he wants to do is unite Germany. At some point, he's going to stop. No. All right, that's not what happened. So Britain and France tried to appease Hitler, but they said, do not invade Poland. All right, that if you invade Poland, we are serious. And in 1939, Hitler invaded Poland, and that starts World War II. Now, the United States isn't going to get involved in this war directly until the end of 1941. But in 1939, the situation here is that Britain and France are at war with Germany, and the United States and the Soviet Union are both neutral. And Germany is practicing a new form of warfare known as Blitzkrieg or Lightning War. You can think of this if you watch football when somebody blitzes. They are going all out. They are going fast. They are trying to rush the quarterback. So this is tank warfare and it is fast moving. This is not World War I all over again. And in 1940, France, which was pretty much ready to fight World War I all over again, they fall very quickly. And for some time, it is only Britain that is fighting Germany, that World War II is really, for all practical purposes, a war between the British and the Germans. So the Battle of Britain, this is a series of air battles in 1940. Now, the United States, the world is falling apart, but so? Okay, Washington's like, look, um, you know, entangling alliances, that sort of thing. And Jefferson, remember how he said that we have been saved from the exterminating havoc of one quarter of the globe, that we should consider ourselves lucky that we are not having to be involved in this European war. World War I was not a great experience for us. And when you look at what it accomplished, or what it didn't accomplish, rather, we didn't get a whole lot out of it. Nobody got a whole lot out of it. And this is kind of the high tide of isolationism, which, you know, you could also call non-intervention or neutrality, but there is certainly an isolationist streak in the United States in the 1930s. And the Neutrality Acts were passed by Congress in 1936, 37, and 39, specifically designed to keep the United States neutral in this conflict. And it banned the sale of arms to belligerent nations. So if you are at war, we will not sell supplies to you, which this was seen as a reason why the United States got involved in World War I. You might remember the Lusitania, which was carrying military supplies. So Congress said that we will not even benefit in any way financially from this war. And so Americans want to stay out of the war, but at the same time, what if Britain falls? When you look at what's going on here with Britain, what happens if Britain falls? Who is left to fight Germany? And what stands in the way of Germany just dominating Europe completely? And the United States, under FDR's leadership, becomes the arsenal of democracy between 1939 and 1941. And 
they find ways, you know, it's like, okay, we're going to kind of take baby steps and this is to help Britain fight the war. And some people may see and saw at the time FDR trying to get us involved in the war, but a lot of historians say this is FDR trying to keep us out of the war. That if we can make it possible for Britain to fight this war and to not be beaten, then we don't have to get involved personally. So first of all, you've got cash and carry in 1931. Pay cash, take it with you. All right, if you can get here and you can pay cash for it, you can have it. Now, of course, the only people who can do that are the British. Destroyers for bases in 1940. And then finally, 1941, lend lease. So the cash and carry, if you can get here, you can pay cash, great. 1939. And then 1940, we get leases on British naval bases in the Caribbean, which I'm not sure how bad we needed them necessarily. But in return, we let Britain use some of our destroyers. Now, if you're familiar with naval warfare, destroyers specialize in anti-submarine warfare, dropping depth charges and that sort of thing. And so these were especially useful in fighting German U-boats. But the thing is, we're not supporting Britain. This is a quid pro quo that we are getting to use the naval bases that we don't especially need right now in return for Britain using these destroyers. And keep in mind, each of these escalates a little bit because finally you've got the Lend-Lease Act, which lets the British borrow our military equipment. And that's where FDR is like, hey, if your neighbor asked to borrow your garden hose, you don't say that'll be 15 bucks. You say, here, just give it back when you're done. And so with the Lend-Lease Act, we lend the British military equipment. Now, by this time, we are helping the British. It's really hard to think about the United States as a truly neutral nation at this time, isn't it? And what's going on in the meantime? Now, FDR signs the first peacetime draft in U.S. history with the Selective Service Act of 1940. Now, on one hand, somebody might say, well, FDR is trying to get us involved in the war. But on the other hand, really, FDR is trying to make sure we're prepared. That's what a president should do, right? So the first peacetime draft in U.S. history, and maybe the only peacetime draft, I believe, but we're still technically neutral. We are not fighting in this war, technically. And FDR makes a campaign promise. And he says about a week before the 1940 election, your boys are not going to be sent into any foreign wars. Now remember, Wilson kept us out of war. George W. Bush in 2000 said that he didn't believe in all of the meddling overseas that Clinton was doing, that he was not an advocate of nation building, that we needed to, you know, have a little less aggressive of a foreign policy under Bush rather than Clinton. We see how that turned out. Now keep in mind, it's only a foreign war if somebody doesn't attack us. So the United States enters the war when they come into conflict with Japan, all right, and the United States, oh, this cursed oh, grab me, all right, an embargo, all right, the Japanese are in, they are engaging in aggressive warfare, and so we just decide to, uh, to oh, grab them. We put an embargo on them, spelled backwards. And Japan will not get oil from the United States, all right? The United States is one of the major producers of oil at the time, which we are again now, thanks to advanced technology, but that kind of slipped away for a bit. But we are not going to provide with Japan with oil. Japan has no access to oil as far as natural resources. So the clock is ticking for Japan. And Japan really, in a lot of ways, doesn't have any other choice than to go to war, all right? So some people say we kind of provoked them. Japan, because keep in mind, like under Herbert Hoover, I believe, you know, when Japan first, uh, you know, engaged in aggressive warfare, we did not place economic sanctions on them. But Japan attacks Pearl Harbor December 7th, 1941, all right? And this is what activates the Axis Pact, this date which will live in infamy. Now, the Axis Pact had been an agreement between Japan, Germany, and Italy that if there was, a, there was a power that entered the war that was not currently in the war, that all of them would weigh in on the same side. So this activates this Axis Pact, and the United States declares war on Japan, and then Germany and Italy declare war on the United States. And the United States now will join the war on the side of the Allies. And, gentlemen... 
and ladies, since we have ladies here, start your propaganda engines. That'll be in the next segment. See you in a bit. <laughs>